And welcome to everyone for joining us this evening on Zoom. Um, it's clearly uh, an intriguing subject that's uh, of considerable interest. Um, lots of people here this evening. And um, so welcome and welcome to our speaker, James Boyce, um, who's joining us from down the road in Tasmania. Um, and where it's 7.30 for us, I think it's 6.30 the following day in the morning for James. So it's no and longer... Valentine's Day is over, Lucy. Yeah, <laughs> I was feeling a bit guilty about inviting you on Valentine's Day. Evening, but we, are, we don't mind being here on Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> but you've passed that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, also in the peak of summer, uh, whereas we're all in jumpers. I think I'm right in think, saying you're in the peak of summer. Um, yeah. I hope you've got your breakfast tea with you. So just to introduce James, uh, he is amongst other things, a historian, particularly interested in where history, people and land interests collide. And um, he's written several books and won prizes and accolades. And I first came across him after he'd published the book that he's going to talk to this evening, about to, uh, this evening, published in 2020. And I was pleased to meet uh, James when he actually came to the UK and I met him in Cambridge last summer, 2022. Um, I think that this is a very important book. It's about the process and the driving forces of the Fen drainage and enclosure and its opposition, of course, and what that was actually about. Um, our colleague, many of you who knew him, Alan Brigham, used to say to me quite often that the drainage of the Fens was the first English imperial project. And I was always intrigued by that. And this is exactly the theme that James uh, is exploring and revealing uh, in his research and his writing. And the significance of this resonates very strongly today in our increasing realization and understanding of the impact of British and European imperialism and the taking of other people's lands and resources. It's a devastating story and it's right on our doorstep. So um, uh, it's, you know, um, it's a small area, but really, really significant in what it perhaps encouraged people to go on to do elsewhere. Um, James is going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll take questions as Simon explained and um, use the chat section if you're used to that or I'll put your hand up um, later and uh, we'll try and field everybody and make sure everybody has a chance to say something and get a nice discussion. So um, make sure you're all on mute as I think you are and I will too and James I'll give it to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy, and um, hello to everybody. It's uh, it's a, a privilege to be with Mill Road Historical Society. I was looking on the internet, and what a um, what a record you've had in terms of getting stories and connecting people to place and critically understanding our 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 homes where we live. And um, yeah, it's a uh, um, it, it's good to be with you. It is, it is the morning, uh, the sun is up, um, so the days are still long, but Tasmania, as some of you, most of you probably will know, is an island off the, off the south coast of Australia, a very large island. We're about the size of Ireland. We only, people think of us as a small island, but um, it's only because uh, the island to the north is so enormous. <laughs> And I'm joining you from Hobart, which is the capital city of the island and state of Tasmania, which is in the south of the island. So it's pretty much between the, the Southern Ocean, uh, between me and Antarctica right now. So it is summer, but it's I've still got a jumper on. It's not the warmest part of Australia. Um, but in terms of reference to our story today, Tasmania is, is part of it because it used to be called Van Diemen's Land and Van Diemen's Land was the jail of the British Empire. We were 
um, nearly half of all the convicts who came to Australia came to came to this island. And the population today is still only about half a million. So those 72,000 convicts who were sent here from, uh, from across the British Empire, but mainly Britain and Ireland, I mean, they're still a very large proportion of the population here is, is, is still got a convict ancestor. Uh, so the empire's close to our heart here. And of course, what happened to our indigenous people in Tasmania, they're suffering. But um, the trying to get a grip around the British Empire, of course, is, as you all know, is a is a lifelong task and some. I mean, it's it's such a multifaceted, complex, so many layers to this. Um, and close to home for me, and talking to you, is is my own grandfather came from Cherry Hinton. I don't know if there's anybody. Uh, anyone joining us from Cherry Hinton today, <laughs> but I know it's only, uh, you know, you can just about walk from Mill Road to Cherry Hinton, can't you? You know, sort of uh, stop at the pub on the way and it's no problem. Yeah. Um, he, and well, he, and his, his family, the boys family came from Cambridgeshire Fens, um, but they moved to Cherry Hinton in the early 20th century. And then when his father died in 1916, his mother took them to an uncle of hers who was in South Africa. Um, and then a few years after that, he stowed away on a, on a ship that he thought was going to Argentina, but its first port of call was Fremantle, the port of Perth in, in west coast of Australia. And he was offloaded there by the ship's captain. But his only prosecution, of course, because it was still the days of the empire, um, the early 1920s, um, he, he committed no migration offence. So it was just three pounds and uh, a few days in Fremantle jail and he was out of there and lived here ever since. And so this, this is the sort of, um, I mean, the we're all products. I mean, very conscious of it in a settled, invaded place like Tasmania, where I live, which is my home. But we're all products of that. And, and I suppose what I'm saying in my book um, and what you've already alluded to, Lucy, is, is to remember that Britain itself is part of the British Empire. I was thinking last, last night that often when we, talk about, when we talk about the Roman Empire or the Russian Empire or the Chinese Empire, we take that for granted that uh, Russia itself or Rome itself are part of these empires, but probably because of the island status, sometimes we forget that Britain is also part of the British Empire and the lives of every British person have been touched in so many ways, not just uh, the people who immigrated or not just the people who migrated or not just the people who were colonised or invaded or conquered or settled or, what, or whatever. It's every single one of us and it's every single patch of country. Um, but the... The, the Fens itself is where some of these themes can really, really be looked at. Um, uh, but uh, first, I just want to start uh, before, before I get into that, um, that just so you know a little bit where I'm coming from, um, you know, one of the most important important task for historians for me. I mean, I, I try and make my living writing serious history for a general audience. I, I believe history, you know, belongs to us all. <laughs> I've never wanted to write for other historians. Um, so I've always tried to pursue, um, I have an association with the university as an associate, but I've never had a wage because I've always wanted to, I've, I've always wanted to write for, for general readers, but I believe serious history can be written for general readers because you know, history is our story. History belongs to the community, if you, you know. <laughs> um, so that's, that's what I, I try to do. Um, and in, when I write environmental history, I don't only write environmental history, but I think environmental history is part of all history in the sense that we're not separated from the land, the land makes us, we're made 
by the land, that sort of interaction. It's not like humans are separate from that. Um, and we have to face, you know, we always have to face the truth looking square on and no one can run away from the suffering and the destruction of human and non-human life that's been part of the Western story, part of the empire story, the terrible harm done to, to other species um, and to each other uh, that has been underpinned by ideas and institutions and economic systems. So we have, to, we have to look that squarely in the eye and face that truth. But sometimes when that's done, it can lead to a sense of sort of hopelessness. Um, the past can become only a problem to be overcome. You know, we have to just move on from this terrible past where our attitudes were awful and we just destroyed things. Um, and, you know, history can just be a sort of documentation of that. And then we led to a position where we tend to reject our cultural heritage um, and feel like we just have to start all over again. And it's a terribly lonely place to be. And given the urgency of the environmental crisis, I think quite a dangerous place to be because of all that diverse sources of wisdom and knowledge and connection that can be found in the past, we lose it. And we can forget also that we actually haven't been modern people for all that long. Um, and even during recent centuries, the past has not just been one place. Um, and the Western inheritance is not just one monolithic experience. The truth is that Western environmental history you know, and British and English environmental history and fen local fens history is a messy, contested place where there's much we can learn and draw strength from. And engaging with the fullness of people's relationship with land over time can open our imaginations as much as shut them down. It can provide us with hope as much as despair. Because when we dig deep into any piece of earth, but, you know, above all that, the ex extraordinary Finland, um, where, where traditional ties to the land persisted as long as they did, we actually find, unsurprisingly, human beings, people like us, people who cared about their families, cared about their communities, cared about their livelihoods, cared about their home. And when these were threatened, they did what, what we're trying to do now. They tried to defend them. Um, and to connect with this, what is actually an extraordinary tradition. I mean, you're, you're custodians and guardians of an extraordinary, inheriting an extraordinary tradition in terms of environmental defense, of defending the fens, its country and its way of life. Um, is, you know, it's a source of sadness, but it's also a source of hope, I, I, I hope, and, and even perhaps of companionship um, with, 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 with these ancestors. Um, but to get to access, to access this, uh, this connection and to access this history of the defence of the Fens, the first thing we have to do is face the reality of cultural difference, that these people are different from us. Um, it can, it, you know, it's, it's, it does take a little bit of work to enter this world. Um, and the first uh, step with this difference, the, 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 the people who lived in the fens up and until a couple of centuries ago and, and really into the, well into the, uh, with echoes well into the 20th century, but there's that the people were commoners. They, um, this was overwhelmingly, the Fenland was common land. And the consciousness of commoners um, is, is a, it's a different worldview, just as it's, so it is a bit like when people say the past is like a foreign country. We, we do have to think a little bit like that, like it's in terms of engaging with these people, it is like going to a different culture 
in the sense they have a different way of experiencing the world, just like we, we encounter when, when we travel. Then, but it's really quite profoundly different because it's pre-modern. It's as different perhaps from contemporary Western people as that of Aboriginal people in my country today. That's the sort of level of difference we can be talking about. Uh, it's a different way of being. And, and the basis of that difference is that each of us carry with it, within us as a sort of common sense view of the world, an assumption that as an individual, we have an identity distinct from our community and on the, and the earth on which we live. We're sort of, we have a, a, a sort of a autonomous being that's, that's separate from both those two aspects. And I'm not criticising this, this modern sort of post-enlightenment understanding of ourselves. Its mindset obviously can be quite liberating. It's come with many benefits as well as costs. I'm just pointing out that for commoners, there's no sharp distinction between how they understand themselves and their relationship to the environment, to their local environment and to each other relationships with self, country and other people are all bound together. Um, so that's one thing we need to, un, you know, we need to sort of uh, sit with. I mean, understanding is too strong a word. It's very, it's, very, it's not, I don't think we can fully grasp, uh, but we can sort of uh, recognise this difference. The other thing, the other thing to know is just a little bit about the commons, because there's a lot of misconceptions and around the world, the commons means many different things. By definition, the commons are local and customary and there's all sorts of commons and there's all sorts of ways of um, dealing with commons. And we're talking about the English commons, which are a very distinctive form of commons. One of them one of the distinctions is that they're not unowned land, which people often sort of assume now. Um, the, in the English common, certainly in the, in the, since the Norman invasion, um, at least all the land is owned by somebody. Um, but the commons aren't about the who owns it, it's about who has the right of access to the resources of that land. Um, so although in later periods um, and through to the present day, common rights have been codified by courts, became a set of, you know, you, you have a, if you live in, in this village and own property here, you might have the right to gather fuel here or the right to fish here or, or whatever, or the right to pasture at a certain time of the year. It all becomes quite a sort of legalistic um, uh, sort of definition in the modern world. But really what we're talking about is deeply ingrained customary relationships that go back, uh, the phrase is time immemorial um, with the natural world and with other local people. So it's a sort of set of customary relationships, how we live together and how we live on this earth. So I guess it does define when we harvest or when we cut the hay or when we cut the rushes and so on, um, and who can do that. But it's, it's bound in custom. Not, it can't just be defined by this set of sort of um, uh, codes and guidelines. And when we talk about enclosure, we're talking about the loss of all those common rights, both you know, the, the legal ones, but also the uh, customary ones. And they have the modern idea of private property. So the person who owns the land has the exclusive use of the resources, has the exclusive right of access, and all those old common rights, you know, which also extend, as you know, in your part of the world, to the right, you know, even the right to access the land, to walk through it, they're extinguished under enclosure unless they're um, specifically protected by that Enclosure Act. The last thing to keep in mind, so it's a very long introduction uh, to set the scene, is what sort of landscape we're talking about. And it's a bit presumptuous of me sitting over here to tell you what your, what your homeland <laughs> is like, except the only problem is it has been rather changed. <laughs> and the, the, the other problem is it was largely changed before photography. And even before 
uh, landscape artists took a lot of interest. They were getting, you know, as we all know, they were always enraptured by mountains and, and in the early 19th century and sort of these romantic seascapes and things. But the wet, wetlands had had a bad press for quite a while and, and uh, there weren't that many artists who recognised the beauty of the of, of of the wetland and anyway by the even by sort of mid 19th century when the romantics are starting to sort of see something in it much of the original landscape had been lost so it's not actually that easy and many of the descriptions we have of it come from those who are trying to drain it um, and rather biased about these sort of dismal swamps um, unhealthy places and provide descriptions which which you've got to read with care <laughs> often. So, so it does take a little bit of work to picture it. Um, and but nevertheless, with that bit of work, it can still be done. Um, certainly the remnants of the old country, and they are just tiny remnants, you know, less than one percent of the old Finland survives. Uh, you have one of the most visited, oldest, you know, very important place in ecological history and tied to the, partly because of it, thanks to its proximity to Cambridge and particularly the University of Cambridge, which had Wiccan Fen. I mean, some people attribute the study, link the study of Wiccan Fen to really the emergence of the discipline of ecology. It's, it's, it's one of the oldest and most studied nature reserves in Britain. Um, but it's only a little fragment. And of course, when you isolate these little fragments, you don't get a picture of the whole because the, the, you know, the, 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 the ecosystem worked on a much larger scale than, than these small glimpses. Uh, nevertheless, it gives us a bit of an image of this wondrous land. And, um, but, and I, would, I thought I'd just, um, just read from the first paragraph rather than trying to find new words, given how long I spent on some of these words. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll read from the first paragraph of Imperial Fen just to give you a little image of the, of the Fen land. I better have a drink of another sip of my tea first. Until a few hundred years ago, the rivers that flowed from central England to the North Sea metamorphosed into a wetland wilderness as they approached the wash. Encouraged by low gradient and high sediment, they broke their banks to meander into countless and ever-changing channels, forming vast reed-covered fens, shallow bird-friendly lakes, and nutrient-rich summer meadows, more akin to the Amazonian delta than the ordered agri agricultural landscape that the fens have now become. And of course, on the higher ground, relatively speaking, as you all know, were the, were the villages. Now, the remaking of the fens from that sort of delta system um, where, you know, that would, would the waters would rise and recede and we had this, the, you know, the saltwater fens near the, near the sea and then the rich uh, peatland fen that, that, that surrounds, uh, that's adjacent to Cambridge um, and stretches right up to, to the wash. I mean, you know, you know this country. Um, it's uh, the, the, the waters would, would rise and fall and change. Rivers weren't set in there permanently under, in their course. Um, obviously seasonal, some, uh, so there were some big areas of some very rich summer pastures when the, when the waters would recede and they'd been fertilised by these nutrients from the rivers of uh, depositing the sediment um, and, of course, building up this extraordinarily, extraordinary peat soil. Um, and in the villages like Ely on the higher ground, well, the, the, of course, Ely is more than a, a village. Sorry to people from Ely, a magnificent place. Um, so the remaking of this landscape uh, into what we know today 
involved two developments that were closely linked, the engineering project called drainage and the privatisation project called enclosure. And the two were closely linked because they depended on each other. To raise the money for drainage, a return on the considerable capital expended by private investors was needed, and that came from enclosure, which, as I said before, involved removing the common rights and essentially privatising the drained land. Um, so, the, in, after enclosure, when, which was sometimes legislation and it, it, sometimes it could be done by so-called voluntary agreement. Um, uh, some, in later years, it was done by legislation, specific, the, literally uh, um, uh, over a thousand individual enclosure acts extinguish, extinguishing common rights over millions of, of, of acres. But in the in the in the Fenland, um, the early enclosure um, is quite a, a story of its own that we'll get to. But after enclosure, the new owner did not just own the land, but they exclusively controlled access to it and its resources. Anyone who entered enclosed property now needed permission. Anyone who sought to access its wealth had to pay for the privilege. In short, the trespassers could now be prosecuted. But as I alluded to. Um, it was not just codified legal rights that were removed, but ancient customary rights. Um, with enclosure, local people are comprehensively dispossessed from their country in the same way uh, that happened in other parts of the world with, uh, with colonisation. They lost access to the wealth of the land, to their social security system, to the traditions and customs that cared for the country and reproduced community and became totally dependent on wage labour to survive. And where paid work was not sufficient to live off, dispossessed commoners sought work in the cities or became part of the great migration that in turn dispossessed other peoples across the empire. Some resorted to crime, including continuing to hunt and fish in a country that what was now defined as poaching. And some of these, of course, ended up in Van Diemen's land. <laughs> So what, um, what was lost was not just access to the material essentials of life, food, clothing, shelter, and sources of income, but as I said before, a whole way of being in the world. People are becoming homeless in a spiritual as well as a literal sense. The red land was not just a resource to commoners. It's not just about, you know, that we get fixated understandably on, on this loss of, of material resources, but it's also a loss of who they were. They're literally losing their home. And I mean, some of you might know the poetry of John Clare, and if you want to get a bit of a sense of, I mean, it probably comes closest to, to what I'm talking about there, the depth, the pain and the loss, the anguish. And as Australians, we sort of grapple and hear those stories from Aboriginal people. It's not just what they're losing is, uh, is far deeper than 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 you know sort of what we associate with just the loss of, a, of, of the ownership of something. It's it's deeply loss of who they are, how they understand themselves. Um, it's their world is being smashed, destroyed, lost. As John Clare beautifully captures in in his increasingly popular poetry. Um, It must have been it, it must have been even harder for local people to imagine a world without their wetland as it is now for us to imagine a world with them. So when the king's contractors in in in, in the uh, Cambridge Fens, it's a very specific enclosure story led by the Stuart Kings. Um, and when the when uh, the, the before the civil war in the sixteen twenties and thirties, and when the king's contractors appeared with their legal documents and detailed plans to drain what they called the Great Level in Cambridgeshire in the sixteen twenties, the vast region of three hundred thousand acres encompassing much of northern Cambridgeshire and western Norfolk, 
the local people must have initially had as little idea as what this would actually mean to them as the indigenous people of Australia, New Zealand and North America had when white man came with other pieces of paper which purportedly proved that they now owned their land. I won't go into the often remarkable engineering works, uh, of course, involving Dutch knowledge and um, uh, involved in the draining of the fens. There's plenty of sources of that, or the intrigues involving a cash hungry court and cashed up investors, which underpinned those first ambitious projects. I do write about this history in Imperial Mud and would also commend for those of you who want to read more on that recent tombs by Eric Ash, a very good book just came out by an American scholar called Eric Ash just a few years ago on, on the draining of the fens, which very much focuses on these political intrigues and what was going on at the time. Ian Rotherham, um, who uh, is a local historian, lives in, um, I think, in southern Lincolnshire, but has also written a very good book in recent years. And I'd also commend an often forgotten, and I think just a remarkable historian, and she was humble, and like a lot of uh, women historians of her, of her era, didn't receive the recognition that, that she deserved. Um, and she was a scholar of Cambridge, Joan Thirsk. Um, her works uh, written mainly you know, in the 1950s, post-war eras, and um, deserve, Joan Thirsk deserves a lot more honor, I believe. Um, but there's some of that in Imperial Mud, uh, but we won't talk more on that today. Um, but just to know that those of you who are involved in local environmental struggles or struggles against developers, I know it's a big issue around Cambridge, um, you know, fighting what can still be a cosy partnership between developers and the state might find some disturbingly similar themes. <laughs> We've got a little bit of that in Tasmania too, I can tell you. I'll, I'd simply point out that there is no evidence, um, I mean, judgments aside about what's right or wrong, um, just being an old fashioned empirical historian, there's no evidence that the drainage and enclosure of the great level was a rational policy attempt to increase output and wealth, which sometimes we just, it's still sort of lazily written like it was just about part of the agricultural revolution increasing output or controlling flood waters, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the, whatever the outcome, we can debate whether or not these were in fact outcomes of drainage legitimately. But in terms of the motivation, it's quite clear that that was not the common good, but private gain. Nor was it a case that there is clarity that the lost fen was less productive than what replaced it. Again, this is an area of legitimate debate. But the old fens, as any visitor to its ruined monasteries, of course, the monasteries before the Reformation were big owners, landowners in the fens, um, and still grand churches and beautiful villages can attest, the old fen produced considerable wealth. Indeed, in many evil times, it's one of the richest areas of England. Some of the wealth of Cambridge colleges who are also big landowners and of course still are some of them. Um, some of the wealth of Cambridge colleges can be traced back to the abundance of the Fen. Um, and such was the common wealth that it secured a level of decency for the common people even after the tithes and taxes had been paid to the monasteries, to the colleges, to other landowners. Um, that, you know, that's one of the most prosperous regions of England. Um, and the importance of the common to women in particular has now been well studied. Um, and it's perhaps not surprising that women were so often active leaders and organisers of the resistance to drainage and enclosure. So much did the wetlands define the commoners well, but no doubt it was only when the waters receded and commoners were deemed to be trespassers on their own country for simply doing what they and their ancestors had always done, that the reality sunk into what enclosure and drainage really meant, a homelessness, a dependence, a poverty and grief, which must have pervaded their whole being. So it's, it's not surprising that as soon as the late 
late 1620s, the fight back had begun. First documented casualty of the conflict occurred in 1628 when a commoner was killed by one of the contracted Dutch drainage uh, workers as he sought to obstruct their works. There would be many more. Armed resistance and direct action involved destruction of the drainage works became widespread both before and after the drainage of the Great Level was deemed complete in 1636. And in the coming decades, dozens of people were injured or died, scores were exiled or heavily fined, hundreds imprisoned for varying periods. Again, I won't go into detail of that resistance today, but I do want to point out how multifaceted it was. I've learned in studying convict history here in, in Tasmania and the survival of Aboriginal people through the first dec decades of con conquest, that resistance can take many, many forms. And most of these are in display in the fight for the Fens. Um, there was ready use of courts and petitions to parliament for a start. And remember the central government this time did not yet have complete control over its own instruments of state. There was not yet a standing army or a police force and law and order relied on local justices and local constables and local juries whose loyalties could be split. Where, where there was communal solidarity, it could be difficult to prosecute those involved in direct, direct action. And we need to remember too, as I said, that there was considerable money being made from the commons. So there were sort of cashed up interests on the other side as well. This was not a poor backward region as apologists for drainage would later claim. The resources of the wetland were rich. We're not just talking about eels here, famous, you know, the, you know, we, you know often the stories told about how many uh, the eels were paid to the, to the to the great monasteries in in ties and just but there were all sorts of marketable products from cattle and fresh fish to geese down and game which found their way to the ports or overland to London and the commoners some of them were some of them were relatively wealthy people and but they also had merchant allies who benefited from the trade and commerce inherit inherent to the old economy and of course I mean there's grades of commoners there's not just some of them are, are, are very poor just making a basic subsistence um, others have uh, uh, have much more influence the story of resistance is full of drama and soon gets closely tied up in the civil war Oliver Cromwell as most of you know is a fen man and while he initially exploited and gave voice to the commoners' grievances and gaining parliamentary and popular support against the king, it was unfortunate for the people of the great level that its major investors, the beneficiary of enclosure, turned out to be parliamentary men, just one of those quirks, accidents of history. Thus, seasoned parliamentary troops, and I mean, we're now talking about uh, men who, who, who were effective military on the ground, experienced soldiers. It was them in the 1650s who forcefully crushed what had become a highly successful resistance. During the 1640s, in all the turmoil of the Civil War, large areas of common land had actually been reclaimed and large areas of wetland had been destroyed. Drainage works uh, just laid waste. Many of the new farmhouses and even a new village or two had been destroyed. And settlers, the tenant, the settlers were brought into the area. Tenant farmers, often the local people, were not, uh, didn't get the tenancies. A lot of um, Huguenot refugees, other Protestant refugees from Northern Europe, were brought in. Um, some of these were, evic were evicted uh, by local people. I mean, there's all this sort of unfortunate tensions that again you get in in settled colonized countries um, often the people copying the most heat are, are not the ones responsible for the suffering and so you know we can feel compassion for some of these Huguenot refugees who, who whose houses are burnt down and who are kicked out these new tenants but they're settlers um, Cromwell's experienced cavalry able to traverse the land quickly 
to, I mean, this is good country for horses in terms of a military advantage, now oversaw the reconstruction, reconstruction of the drainage works and the recovery of the enclosed lands. And at least in the great level, the enclosures were largely restored and a new order came into being. But in the vast wetlands inland from Boston and southern Lincolnshire, uh, the less well-known part of, 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 the, of, the, of the vast Finland, it was a very different story. There the commoners got quite lucky because those who had undertaken the drainage and enclosure in the 1630s had stayed loyal to the king. So here the destruction of the drainage works was allowed to remain and they actually had a victory. The, the, the enclosures were destroyed, the wetland came back and the common was restored. Um, and so comprehensive was the commoners' victory in Lincolnshire at this time, and so nervous were future investors because of the risk of losing their capital should future schemes be pursued, that it was 120 years before drainage and enclosure were again seriously pursued in that part of the world. And when it came, the drainage and enclosure of most of the Lincolnshire fens in the six, 1760s and 1770s was particularly brutal, because it's now a, a, a different sort of state the commoners knew now exactly what they were fighting for. They knew the consequences and they were inspired by the success of their ancestors. But the state in the 18th century, late 18th century was a very different beast, far more powerful uh, than it was in the mid 17th century. Strategy was also more carefully thought through in parliament courts and not least the new standing army that Britain now had was employed. The Scotch greys were, were used to great effect. So this was a this was crushed, the Lincolnshire resistance at this time, just con by, by coincidence, coinciding with the uh, col first colonisation of Australia, this, uh, was crushed with the use of the army. Commoners were deliberately divided, communities were collectively punished against something that happened to Indigenous people here. So, you know, it's not really meant to be part of the law, is it? Like a crime is committed, you're supposed to find the person who committed the crime. That doesn't really work in Indigenous resistance because it's been conducted by whole communities. Who's the, who's the enemy? You know, they stick together. So what they did in the Fens, what they were doing in the late 18th century is what they were doing in Australia they were, and what they're doing in North America whole communities, whole villages got punished um, rather than just an in, the, the individual as well as individuals. Crushing fines and a range of other harsh punishments available under the notor notorious Black Act, the early 18th century, which gave enormous power to the courts and other legislation was imposed. But even in this punitive context, resistance still secured some significant concessions. I write about the Isle of Axum in, you know, northern, in, in, in uh, eastern Yorkshire and, and nor northern Lincolnshire. Um, I know it's not normally considered uh, part of the Fens, um, the Isle, but it's got the same story. It's sort of geographically and regionally and in terms of identity, a lot of the history overlaps. And so quite a number of historians have done what I've done and included its story. And it had one of the most successful stories of resistance. I won't go into all that today because I'm suddenly conscious of time. Um, but that was uh, so successful up there that you can still, um, uh, you can still visit. One of the very few places in England where you can visit open fields is around Epworth. Uh, the village where um, John Wesley came from um, in the Isle. Um, it's not that the wetland is still there now, of course, there's been stories subsequently, but for centuries it was protected and the story was remembered and it was a remarkably successful resistance that, you know, did also involve the destruction of whole villages of, of, of Huguenot settlers, sadly, um, as well. I mean, there's, there's you know, churches were burnt down up in the aisle. Incredible, but very, very associated with some quite famous figures from the Civil War. A worth a read of itself. Um, uh, 
in that way, if you want to read a romantic old novel about this remarkable resistance, I suggest John Hamilton's 19th century book, The Manuscript in a Red Box, which will give you a bit of a flavour for, for what was going on. I just want, I'm emphasising a couple of those successes enjoyed by the resistance, or just that how powerful and long lasting and what an impact it had to the drainage and enclosure because of what I started with, what I talked about before, it's so important that we confront this contemporary mindset, which can be found even among many people working to save and restore our planet, which is a sort of a deterministic perspective on the past, which can ferment despair about the future. Too often we start history from the reality of the present and work backwards to explain the tragedy of what happened. We see a drained and largely destroyed ecosystem and ensure, assume this was the inevitable product of the past. But, and largely, our, unconsciously, our history then becomes determinist. What is had to be. But if we see the past as determined by large forces of change, which are so powerful they could never be resisted by mere human beings, it is very hard to see the future in any other way. However hard we try, big money, big interests, big institutions, sheer greed is always going to win out in the end. Um, so we need this sort of history. Our imagination as to what is possible, what is realistic to achieve, becomes constrained by our straight-jacket straight jacket view of the reality of the past. This sort of history is not empirical because it does not begin in the past but the present. It misses the fact there are always different choices, different possibilities, and different realities existed at the same time, and many contradictory outcomes were achieved. History was not predetermined. Policy choices were made and taken, and those policy choices were made by human beings. And resistance has been a real factor in the mix. It's really mattered in this complex missive business. Um, and what it gave above all was time, and time matters. I mean, when you hold back a when you hold back the drainage for, for, for over a century, that makes a difference. It makes a big difference because time produces all sorts of uh, uh, capacity for adaptation, accommodation and change. It provides people, indeed birds and animals, time to sometimes respond in highly creative ways. Um, look, I better keep moving because I'm suddenly conscious of the of the time um and i did i do go into the invite the fact that the other big chapter that uh, go in the book the other big factor that comes into play is not just people who fight back in a sense it's the land itself the what they thought they'd achieved uh, with the drainage of the great level in the 17th century turned out not to be quite as the dutch had planned because of the strange behaviour of peat, as many of you will know, where peat, when exposed to the air, oxidates. Um, and so the ground literally, we start to lose the peat when it's dry and the ground starts to subside. And what country that had been just above ground level, suddenly sinking below ground level. So how do you keep it? Um, how do you keep it dry in the eight? The, no longer these Dutch drainage schemes were working because there wasn't a gradient to the sea. So they had to bring in the windmills in the 18th century. But there's still the problem is the more successful the drainage, the more successful they are at keeping the ground dry, the larger the problem as the peat oxidates and you also have evaporation and soil loss in other ways. And so by the end of the 18th century, a lot of wetland has been restored just by this process, the steam, the windmills aren't keeping up. And it's not really until the coming of the steam engine in the, from the 1820s that you start, we start to think that the, the drainage schemes are going to be a, a permanent success. But even there, um, you know, the, there's the great drainage of Whittlesea Mere, the last big lake, what had been the largest Lowland Lake in England was drained in the 1850s and it seemed to be the high point of steam power and Victorian success. There are even plans to drain big areas of the wash 
um, at this time, you know, um, that, that never came to fruition, partly paradoxically because of the arrival of cheap food from the empire, cheap grain in the late 19th century, meant that there wasn't the money to be made anymore out of, out of agriculture to get a return. So leading, really leading up to the Second World War, there, there's this paradox of the returns are, 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 getting, are getting less and the cost of, even with steam power, the cost of keeping this area dry um, in a, uh, is, is, is so large that, that there's actually, a, the landscape, you know, is, is if many of you will, will hope, I really encourage people to read Graham Swift's wonderful novel, Waterland, if you haven't read it. And, and really, I mean, what Graham Swift there is capturing is that pre-Second World War, War fen. Um, the fenland that we know today, paradoxically, because of this environmental um, impacts, uh, realities and the legacies of, um, and the, you know, the sort of low agricultural prices that, that were in the late 19th, early 20th century. The, the Finland we know today is really a product of the Second World War. It's actually quite a, um, it's, it's since the second, you know, the drainage that began the Second World War to increase um, food production and then the industrial flood mitigation projects and uh, which followed the disastrous floods of the early 1950s. Um, and then of course the big money that went into agriculture with the EU. And so this, this really successfully highly drained industrial agricultural landscape that we have today is from the developments from the 1940s to the 1980s. But then, but yet again, again, as many of you all know, we're in a period where the custodians of the fens, be they farmers, engineers, bureaucrats, and local people, again, needing to learn to live with the waters in new and sustainable ways, because it's pretty clear by now that, in, that they're not gonna be, we can't just continue as we have been, that they can't be permanently banished. Um, and a number of land managers and, um, are working together to try to work out again how we can live with the waters. And I, I talk about the Great Fen Project in the book, uh, one of the restoration projects, but which is looking at how you combine, it's not a case of farming or nature restoration, it's about learning to drawing on uh, traditional knowledge, but also scientific research and real world experience to manage the waters and restore ecosystems and farm the land in sustainable ways. You can never restore the Whittlesea Mere, even though this the Great Fen project centered on that, because the Whittlesea Mere is now a little hillock because it had a uh, sandy loam soil. So it is now much higher than the surrounding country, which is many meters below sea level, because that was peatland that has now been lost. Um, but do get involved and visit the Great Fen Project and be inspired. It's a, you can have a look on the internet, a wonderful project. But the Fens has always been a fast changing landscape. I mean, it's another, I want to leave, you know, finish on a bit of hope because another thing that the Fens can teach, teach us all, you know, it's a, uh, it's a benefit to study because it's always been a rapidly changing plan. Rivers could always change course from year to year. Coastlines were moving considerable distance, sometimes within single lifespans. So we're in a time of rising waters because I mean, of course, the other point I didn't mention at the moment is the rising sea level, which is posing enormous challenges to parts of the fens. Pastures have always come and gone. Living with the waters never meant living in an unchanging wilderness. This was always a land being remade by natural and human action. My point in Imperial Mud is not that the people did not change the land, but it also changed them. An extraordinary wetland was shaped by human intervention over thousands of years, but in a way that sustained nature and community and provided the natural wealth on which humans as much as duck, eels and butterflies relied. The Fens was their country, their home, and our challenge in the 21st century is to follow their example in this respect. A task is not just to quarantine sections of the natural world in reserves and otherwise carry on as before, but to learn how to truly be got along 
And um, I don't, have we got time for me to read a paragraph? Well, perhaps I should close then so we've got questions. What do you think, Lucy? I was going to read the last paragraph of the book, but we've probably a bit, yeah. I've gone over time a bit. Haven't? That's fine. Um, Is it? Okay, I'll read, I'll read you the first paragraph of the book. So I thought I'd read you the last one and close then and we'll have some questions. The Fens have always been a country on the move, existing as both a natural landscape and a human created one, changing from century to century, year to year, and season to season because of environmental change and human intervention. Impermanence is integral to the spirit of a land created by the flow and fluidity of water. All that has ever been geographically fixed is a few islands, the sky and a vast horizon, an unchanging reference point for the shifting waters below. Rising seas and sinking soils do require changes in land management, but in this part of England, there is nothing new about that. Right, thank you. <laughs> That's... <laughs> thank, thank you very much, James. Um, uh, nice. there, there is a huge amount in 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 your in your book um, to explore, and then it's great also to have the references in it. Um, and you've introduced lots of themes this evening. Um, yeah. I can see a few um, questions in chat. And yes, should I? I should click on those, shouldn't I? I'm yeah, always. This is the I bit where I always get a bit muddled. I'll I'll start off with with John Grant's comment to everyone um, about developers and and the state, developers and government against the local population. That's happening now with the plan to move Water Beach Railway Station from the village to the new town. So yeah. there is there is a, a constant conflict um, yeah. and a question as to, you know, do the local people want this and does it matter that local people don't want it? Who, yes, who yes. makes these decisions? Um, and then there's actually a, a question um, from Nick. I'll read that out. So I have P Flemish ancestors who came over to the UK in the 1600s, according to family legend, to drain the mm. fence. Mm, you yeah. mentioned Dutch engineers and French Protestant refugees, but did you come across any Belgian labourers during your research? And if so, yeah. what could you tell me? Thanks. Nick. Yeah, well, mine, I'm, the, I'm in the same position, actually. I've... Um, Boyce is Dubois. Uh, so my ancestors were, um, were came across as, whether as drainage workers or as tenants, I'm not sure, but certainly part of that refugee mi migration. Um, so yes, the, Flem uh, the Flemish uh, are part of that. Um, so, I mean, sometimes I just allude to I mean, because Huguenots, we tend to think of just as 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 the French, but there was the it was really Protestant refugee. Might, not not all of them had been evicted, but they were all you know seeking a, a, a new life. Some of them came across. Some of them did work on the drainage projects because as part of the resistance, sometimes local people. That's one of the things we didn't talk about. Some of them sometimes they just refused to work, and those are very labour intensive, as you can imagine involving thousands of people just digging with with spades and other simple implements um prisoners of war were employed uh, also some, uh, on occasion um but it was a labor intensive task um and uh the dutch when i referred to the to the dutch i meant the the engineering knowledge, I suppose. The Dutch had become the engineers of Europe were involved in drainage schemes all over, using the knowledge obviously they'd built up in their own country. But in terms of the workforce, that was, was much more varied. But a lot of them were, you know, you have you go back to the history of Europe at this time and the Protestant Catholic clash to uh, to get the, the history. But yes, I the voices and also on my other side were. Pete's, the, my mother's side, um, P double E T, not P A T. Um, they so they've gave coming over from Holland, but I don't think involved. I don't think they were engineers. I think they were just also um, refugees or perhaps economic migrants too. Um, 
with different opportunities. I mean, there's a lot of money, a lot of capital being expended, a lot of new opportunity. Um, so it's a place of it's a place of migration, but particularly from from those areas, those um, Protestant areas of northern Europe, of Holland, of what we now know as Belgium and of northern France. Um, Nick, are you are you there? Does that ring a bell with what you know about your family? Chris has just put a comment up on there about the Thornley records. There's been a couple of books written about the um, those migrations, and um, I think there's even a Huguenot society. Is that still going? I know they used to. Yep, great. Um, so Edward Lloyd Jenkins has put in a comment with the burgeoning effects of global warming and rising sea level, the efficiency of fen drainage is now an increasing topic of conversation with maps showing the possibility of the North Sea lapping at the outskirts of Houston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that's others that others are better qualified, I know, probably in the audience to talk about that than me. But I, um, you know, the Finland's going to be really at the, at the front line of dealing with climate change. Um, so much is below sea level. Um, and with rising seawaters and rising energy costs, um, there's got to be new ways of farming and new ways, you know, which, where is the sea going to be allowed in? Where is it going to go? And obviously these flood basins, restoring flood basins where the waters can sit at least seasonally is going to be crucial. So, I mean, there's some very clever people and um, doing a lot of work on this. And what I think I find particularly exciting in, um, from my conversations is the sort of coalitions of people, different groups, um obviously you know this is obviously important with with farmers and ecologists and engineers and water managers and drainage boards and government department i mean it's a sort of um you know it really does require that sort of holistic thinking and the old way of that we can just sort of beat nature we can tame it we can manage it i think pretty it's, that's pretty much seems to be universally accepted that that that's just not going to work in the in the 21st century. Um, there's got to be a, a new way of thinking. So it's a sort of the challenges are enormous, but but in a sense, in the fens, I think yeah, the being confronted with a challenge that we all have, but it just the urgency and the immediacy is there. Um, and I what I and certainly not alone in this, but what I hope my, you know the book contributes is there's just that sense of the history of that, which can be just a case of consolation and drawing strength from, but also you know the, what I talked about that the tradition we can get open up our imaginations with tradition. It's not just about applying traditional knowledge. Um, but some of and not not just applying traditional techniques. Obviously, modern science, you know, contemporary science is is critical. Um, but it's also a different consciousness, a different way of thinking, a different way of being. And I mean, this is part of the challenge as well. <laughs> you know, how we live, how we live with the earth is not just about getting new technology, technological answers. We actually have mm -hmm. to sort of <clears throat> live differently on the yeah. earth and with each other. We yeah. think our relationships. Yeah. Um, so there's a, song, a question about something a bit different, singing. <clears throat> uh, Fiona, I'm going to read it out for you, Fiona, if that's right. Um, what role did singing and protest songs have in the resistance to the enclosures and draining of the fens? As a member of a local choir, I've sung some of these songs, retrieved yeah. from Vivian by our diligent choir director. Do you know? Oh, well, Fiona, look, I'd love to know more about that. Um, you know, singing again is, you know, inherent to judicious, traditional culture, isn't it, in a way that it's hard for us to imagine, you know, singing while you're working, you know, singing in the gatherings, singing is a, um, so it, it must have been, and it's also, of course, a form of communication, um, a form of passing on story, it's a part, it's a form of memory, you know, drawing on inspiration, so I mean, those Lincolnshire defenders, uh, the stories are being passed on of the successful resistance, you know, from 120 years before. Part of that would have been in song, you know, up in the up in the aisle, they they 
the carrying on, you know, they were being enriched by stories of, of ancestral stories, but also, you know, protest songs, which I'm sure, um, but I don't know a lot about that. Um, I can imagine it and I really would love to hear your choir singing some of those. Maybe, I don't know if there could be some sort of link. I mean, there's some famous poems and, and, and ditties which must have been also often sung that have come down to us um, through the years. But a lot of it in an oral culture, as you know, like all oral, oral cultures, um, so much is lost um, and can now only be imagined because unless someone goes around at some point recording them, um, we lose we lose so much and and that that story is repeated all over, isn't it? Um, you know whether you're talking about um, other parts of Britain, like you know the west coast of Scotland, so much of that those songs and poetry and heritage was lost, but. But some some we've kept, you know, in you know, the same in Aboriginal Australia, of course, here, all oral cultures. It's the tragedy of 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 the oral culture when the continuity is lost. But um, the fact that you've got some of those songs is is wonderful. I'd love to hear them, and you'd know more about it than me, I think, Fiona. There, yeah. If 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 I can um, facilitate any connection between you two, I'm happy to do that. So yeah, yeah, it'd be lovely. Yeah, it'd probably be. It's a good counterpoint to sort of all this wordy, heady talk, like I give as well. You know, to just sit and hear one of those songs can make us feel stuff and connect with stuff, connect with feelings that you, know, you can't always do with just uh, reading a book. <laughs> mm. Yeah, very good point. Very mm. good. Um, question from Penny. Penny, shall I read it out? Where are you, Penny? Uh, question about the start of the story. You described the Fenish as pre-modern with a different identity to us. Do you mm. think the commoners had different social structures, allegiance to clans, lodges, tribes, for example, rather than just family or parish? Did they see common cause with all Fen dwellers? That is such an interesting, such an interesting question, and there's it's very difficult. There's not really a sort of um, simple answer to that. I mean, the um, one of the things about indigenous cultures that we have an idea, we tend to sort of have an idea they're fixed in time and place and identity, um, but of course they're they're changing all the time. And the fens is, I mean, in the beginning of the book, I do race through thousands of years of history but um there which we didn't talk about today that we do tend to think in in um in history of we like to sort of wrap it up in stages and in english history it's often done with invasions you know you have history is almost can come across as if it's begins again, you know, with the Roman invasion and this happens in the Fens and then the Anglo-Saxons and then this happens with the Fens and the Normans and this happens with the Fens. And the Fens are often, because they're a wetland and hard to conquer, often have sort of central roles in these, in these stories. And, you know, the old, the Romans displace the, after a big struggle, the old Celtic tribes and, you know, it's, but it's, the truth, of course, for ordinary people is that this continuity as much as uh, as change. These invaders do not sort of make uh, make history from from the beginning all over, you know. And especially once the sort of direct political sort of resistance stops, especially you know in these wetland areas which are hard to sort of subdue. And if there's not active resistance, they basically you know let people get on with it. So there's a lot of sort of continuity of culture, but also it's changing all the time. And of course, influenced by what's happening in, in the wider world, they're not living in some sort of completely cut off from the world. So when do sort of tribal loyalties merge out of the regional loyalties? Well, the, the primary loyalty is to their local people. So, you know, that's becoming, starting to be talked about as the parish, um, rather than tribes, obviously, by the period I'm talking about, they're 
it's a it's a local belonging they also that doesn't mean that they you know certainly by the period i'm talking about there's also not some sort of nascent developed slowly developing national identity i mean that does take time to emerge but you know people start can be both have their primary loyalty locally but also you know recognize that they're english um certainly there's a sort of um sense often there's appeals to the king to the monarch in these early struggles you know they're seeing the, the the king should be taking action on their behalf you know their subjects you know they but the really interesting question too that you get you the the the, the um is whether there's a regional identity of coming from the fens um that cuts across these local boundaries, that cuts across even county boundaries and, and uh, parish boundaries. Now, I think that what happens, and it's the same, like if I could just give an example from Tasmania again. So when the British arrive in, in, in my island of Tasmania in 1803, so you know, fairly recently, really, not that long ago, there's seven different main language groups of Aboriginal people. So, you know, what we can call nations, um, uh, different, different units. Now, they don't have a notion of being a Tasmanian Aboriginal person. You know, their, their identity and, you know, is locally based, obviously. Um, that, but then um, what happens is as the British... Uh, settlement colonisation expands as fighting increases in the end, there's an identity emerges by the 18, is, you know, really by the late 1820s, 1830s of being a Tasmanian Aboriginal, being Aboriginal, that we actually share something in common with these other tribes who in the past we might not have had anything to do with because they lived on the other side of the island and we didn't have sort of even sort of um, much, you know, much contact with them and spoke a different language and lived in a different world. But under the pressure of colonisation, under the pressure of a shared enemy, they developed a common identity. And I think something of that happened in the Fens. So it wasn't, it was actually a product of the, of the threat of drainage and enclosure, this sort of shared shift that they start to said, get themselves a sense of being from the fens, having a fen, a fenland, a fen, a fen, not, I mean, I've invented, we could have that conversation later, slightly controversially, that new word fenish, just to try and describe this sort of shared cultural experience. Um, but it's under that process of modernization, the processes of enclosure, the process of colonization, that they get them they get a sense of themselves having a shared cultural identity and start to talk of uplanders and outsiders and and so that sort of that shared common identity is in a sense a product of the shared common threat if that makes sense but it's always it lives alongside um a number just like we did. I mean, there's nothing new about having multiple identities. We think that's just a sort of strange 20th first century sort of thing, how we have all we live with all these different identities. Um, human beings have always had that. But the primary identity uh, is local community, local, local people, whatever language and terms are put around that. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's how I see it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Comprehensive. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, James. There's a comment from Jo who's actually had to leave us, but she says she lives in so I'm pretty much in the middle of one of the commons. Yes. We're very close to her. Yeah. And it's really amazing to see the changes in the fen water level through the seasons. Yes. Yeah, and there was a, quite a struggle and so on too with the, with the commons. So I think I, I make some brief reference to that, but um, yeah. 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 Does anyone else have any questions or comments they'd like to make now whilst we're all still together? I can't see everybody, but I think if you, if you, um, if anyone wants to unmute un, uh, themselves and just speak, that's fine. 
I'd, I'd like to say something about how your comments about it being a very prosperous area resonates with what I know about the Fens earlier. So um, in the Roman times, it was considered extremely prosperous and it may even have been well, it may even have been Roman imperial. When I saw your book, Imperial Mud, I thought maybe you were, before I looked at it, it was a mm -hmm. Roman fens, but it's thought that probably that the fens were probably an imperial, may well have been an imperial, a Roman imperial estate. This is yes. A lot, yes. a lot to um, take yeah. from the fens. Yeah. Uh, and also the areas. Uh, the East, this East Anglian area, and possibly up into Lincolnshire, has uh, is both an amazing place for uh, hoards, gold, gold and silver treasure. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. There are yeah. Lots of different types of wealth, obviously, but um, yeah, the, yeah. The Roman Empire was probably interested in the um, wealth from the environment, from everything they could get from there. But it made people, local people, extremely wealthy. And yes, some yeah. of this wealth. Yeah. I think we wealthy. have. <laughs> Yeah, and the Romans. Do, do you think the Romans brought in malaria? Do you think there's that sort of oh, I don't something? Know. I, can't. I don't know. Yeah, because but point also point. paradoxically helped in the defence because you know over time it became seen as disease written, but that was mainly for outsiders and locals would build up an immunity. And the metal spade uh, that they brought in, which had massive impacts, there was a lot of. Uh, the Romans introduced the metals. But, but a lot of the, where you're talking about the wealth there, Lucy, and it's the same in the mid, Middle Ages, it's openly talked about what a wealthy area it is. Um, and also, you know, the beauty of the Fens is talked about, but especially its productivity. And really the idea um, that it's just sort of some wasteland, unproductive wasteland, is very much comes out of the literature of those who are seeking to drain it and we need to i mean it's 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 openly part of the campaign to so we but we carry it was it was very successful we carry and this is all done all over the world with wetlands of course i mean wetlands have been drained um with increasing the intensity right up to the present day um a terrible environmental tragedy uh, what's happened to, to to wetlands and what is continuing to happen to them and part of the sort of marketing or propaganda of, of, of this drainage is that the old land has to be a sort of disease ridden dangerous unproductive swamp and so we carry these you know these ideas of they're actually not not totally I mean there's always been the wetlands always been had mixed messages because it's been hard to tame and control the same as forests you know they've been places of threat to order and to political authority but but these sort of images that it's an unproductive sort of swampy wasteland are actually associated directly both in the fens and around the world with those who are destroying them and replacing them for their own gain with with a different form of landscape and um and it's very hard to tax the output of the fens as well these sort of you know where you can tax and you can get rents from and you can capture the wealth of a drained country these sort of common lands the wealth almost by definition is more widely distributed you know like if you're collecting eggs or you're hunting ducks are collecting fish like people this the total output might be similar to the sort of output of a of a series of tenant farms or even greater but of course the the drained uh, the the neat ordered tenanted farms are paying regular rents they're paying their tithes they're paying their taxes so it's also it's about sort of control it's about it's about appropriating the wealth, who the wealth's going to, more than the total, total wealth. But read, you know, we, the 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 um, the recognition of this area being a wealthy area is pretty mainstream until the 17th century, and it's no coincidence that it's in the 17th century that the modern drainage era begins. I mean, of course, the Romans did drainage, as you know. Um, everybody did drainage. There was drainage done through the Middle Ages, but it's a different sort of drainage. It's a, 
it's a sort of localized, very in tune with the particular local area. It's about managing these water flows. It's not this industrial scale remaking of an entire landscape. So the drainage was also using the language of um, improvement and mm. it had a kind of uh, a moralistic overtone. Mm. Yeah, so improvement is the, is the language that's used. It's particularly in the 18th century. It's very much language of the Enlightenment and after. Um, and improvement is, is standard language in this sort of agricultural revolution, if you like, improving the land, improving its output. But it has both. It's, both, it's also about improving people. So it has an, it's, it's a moral land, you're redeeming the land and you're also redeeming the people. So the people, it's not just the wetland that becomes a sort of barbarous wasteland, but the local people, the commoners are all described a bit like, again, like Aboriginal people here and other Indigenous people. They are, um, they're uncivilised, you know, they're talked of as savages even, um, not fully Christian, you know, so they're can so the... The project of reclaiming the land, um, colonising and improving the land is also colonising, improving the people, you know, turning them into Christian civilised people. So again, that's, it's the similar language that's been used around the empire uh, for the, it's sort for of the colonisation project. So improvement has that, those dual, dual elements, you know, mm -hmm. this uh, quite openly, um, even to the... I'm not just talking about the um, the Calvinists or the um, uh, those with a sort of strong Protestant uh, religion um, that you know the who 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 do this in very specifically religious terms, but even the 18th century improvers, the enlightened gentlemen, are doing it, seeing this as a moral moral work, redeeming people and land at the same uh, together. Yeah. Sort of and blending it with the the privatization and the and the profit to yeah yeah and sadly uh, today the fens are a very poor area although obviously a lot of wealth is is taken off it um, yes yes and and quite paradoxically big areas of the fens quite depopulated um, you know it's struggling now to keep a school or yeah to keep services uh, because of course modern you know industrial farming to be done on a scale where it can be returned doesn't require much labor force anymore so um you know this um again one of the paradoxes of uh this, of improvement taken to an extreme that we saw in other parts of britain as well of course most famously in the scottish highlands where you know the the most profitable form of the land is is sheep didn't require many people and you have whole areas depopulated i mean these um agricultural improvement uh, can mean empty <laughs> empty lands over time i mean initially there was a lot of people employed in the drainage that we've talked about and in the there were a lot of wage labourers, but even by the nineteenth, even you know in the nineteenth century, a lot of the work seasonal and poorly, you know it's not permanent work. That's where the, a lot of the poverty is. There's sort of seasonal work available, and a lot of local people have to leave, um, because whereas before that, with the common, they could get by with a bit of seasonal work. I mean, they might still have had some wage work, the commoners. But the resource, this resource, this bounty, this, you know, what it can be like a social, it is like literally a social security system. That's what they can get through the, you know, that's what they can, they're not reliant on the wage labour. After the enclosure, they're reliant on the wage labour, but that might only be available at certain times of the year and then they have nothing to fall back on. And so lots of them migrate and they start to use a lot of, um, uh, working gangs are travelling through the fens in the 19th century. A lot of Irish who are just doing this seasonal work, like seasonal workers that we have picking the fruit in 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 Australia. And I know you have a lot of you know a, a lot of uh, workers come in from outside who have to you know do the harvest in the fens still today. Yeah, because it's just not the local workforce. Yeah, right. Well. Interesting stuff. There are a few more comments um, that I could read out. 
but I don't think that any more. Um, now I've lost the lot here. I uh, don't think there are any more questions. Um, lots of compliments. Thanks for the talk. Um, always interested. To, interesting to learn something from your talks each time thanks must reread reread your book again recommend oh thank you very much yeah. and edward oh Rodney. hello chris if you're still there hello chris if you want to hear more about the great fen projects and environmental projects through the fens and chris is the person to talk to not me really <laughs> right okay well chris thanks for attending and uh commenting mm. and thank you um there you are. Um, Ed Lloyd Jenkins says there's discussion now taking place um, with a view to allowing the sea to encroach on large areas south of the wash to create a huge salt marsh environment. So yeah, lots to to watch out for um, in terms mm. of management plans and plans. Mm. Yes, and there's the um, I was I was fortunate to meet the people from Friends of the Cam when I was in Cambridge last year. Um, and there's some very, very knowledgeable people in there and too in terms of um, managing, uh, you know, how, how we're going to look after and manage manage the the CAM and and and, and its river systems and protect it and um, and all and threats to it. So they'd all relate to this history as well. Hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, James. Um, oh, Ned, Chris has got the message there. Did you see that, Lucy? Do look um, at, yeah, fenedgetrail.org. Um, that's, okay, yeah. Can everyone so see that's, that? So that, that yeah. will talk to you about that sort of great, uh, great fen restoration project too and a new a walk you can do around the old, what was the old Whittlesea Mere and lots of information about, about that Um the old landscape, but also the um, the work that's been done now, really exciting restoration work, so imaginative and creative and, you know, collaborative. Yeah. Mm. Gives us hope and we need a bit of hope, don't we, Lucy? We do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, after all that, all those centuries of pain of the dispossessed as mm. well. I um, hope some of them can see this in a different way but thank you very much indeed for a really fascinating talk and for joining us this evening and um, that is mm. a big advantage of zoom we would never have been able to get you although perhaps when you next visit cambridge we could invite you to come and oh, i'd love to come along and i'd love to walk along mill road again and, yes. and soak yeah. it soak it up the best yeah. part of cambridge it is it's, it's very special um yeah very special so uh let's all thank Thank you very thank much you for very coming nice along and, and I'll just thank you for your support and you know it's and accepting this Australian writing a book about your home with such grace <laughs> and generosity.